Tonight, celebrated Indigenous leader Dr Loicha O'Donoghue dies aged 91. Also tonight, the Prime Minister defends his integrity as he sells his tax cut changes. In the second day of operations against Iran-linked groups, British and US forces strike 36 Houthi targets in Yemen. And an increase in shoplifting has some Canberra retailers worried. Yulma, good evening and welcome to ABC News. I'm James Gleamday coming to you from Ngunnawal country and we also acknowledge other people and families with connection to the lands of the ACT. Well, Australia has lost one of its most celebrated Indigenous leaders with the death of Dr Loicha O'Donoghue, aged 91. The former Australian of the Year spent her life fighting for the rights of First Nations people, spending decades in senior Aboriginal community leadership positions. Dr O'Donoghue's family has given permission for her name and image to be shared. Even after leaving public life, Dr Loitcher O'Donoghue continued to pass on her knowledge and fight for reconciliation. We were stolen, uh, but we need to move on. Born in remote South Australia to an Aboriginal mother and a pastoralist father, Dr O'Donoghue and her two elder sisters were taken from her parents when she was just two. She was trained to be a domestic worker. I feel angry about the policy that removed us and also took away our culture uh, took away our language and took away our families. 30 years went by before she saw her mother Lily again. And what I saw was a woman who had been undone. Dr O'Donoghue put her efforts into improving the health of her people, fighting discrimination to become the first Aboriginal nurse in South Australia. She joined the public service and spent her career advocating for Aboriginal rights and welfare and became the first Australian Aboriginal person to address the UN General Assembly that the Australian Constitution be changed to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the continent's original inhabitants. We are a nation that knows itself uh, now better than at, at any time in the past is a lot to do with Lord O'Donoghue. But Dr O'Donoghue can best be described by her family who said we adored and admired her when we were young and have grown up full of never-ending pride as she became one of the most respected and influential Aboriginal leaders this country has ever known. Former Senator and Elder Pat Dodson said hers was a strong voice and her intelligent navigation for First Nations people's rightful place in a resistant society resulted in many of the privileges we enjoy today. And from Prime Minister Anthony Albanese, Dr O'Donoghue walked tall and her example and inspiration made us all walk taller. A remarkable life to be honoured by the South Australian Government. There will be an offer of a state funeral uh, to a family. An appropriate celebration of the life of a First Nations pioneer. Anthony Albanese insists he's an honest person as he defends a broken promise and sells his tax cut changes to the public and parliament. Federal parliament returns this week with the tax cuts top of the agenda. Tom Lowry reports. Questions of character. I'm asking whether your word is still your bond. David, I'm an honest person. As the Prime Minister sells a tax turnaround. Low and middle income Australians are under pressure. What I can't do as Prime Minister of Australia is to wring my hands and say if only there was something I could do about it. Internal polling is telling Labor the public broadly likes its stage three tax changes. The question is what voters make of a broken promise. Circumstances have changed and what we've done is respond to the changed economic circumstances. Labor still hasn't fixed the unfairness in the stage three tax cuts. But first, the government has to convince the Greens or the Coalition. We'll be fighting for more for low and middle income earners when this comes to Parliament. The bill will land in Parliament on Wednesday, but has been made public today, ahead of party room meetings tomorrow and Tuesday. Some in coalition ranks want to take a stand. We should stick with uh, what Australians have been promised, what uh, the Labor Party voted for, what the Liberal Party voted for, what the Australian people voted for, which were the stage three tax cuts. Others sounding more open-minded. We'll be pragmatic, we'll discuss the, the details of that, but we want to put as much back in people's pockets as we can. 
Peter Dutton has already dropped hints the coalition won't look to block this legislation. It may opt to vote these changes through and take its own tweaks to the next election. The government is confident it's starting the parliamentary year on the right note, and it hopes that might carry through to a looming by-election. Tom Lowry, ABC News, Canberra. The federal government will introduce new rules requiring car companies to supply more fuel-efficient vehicles to Australia. Australia has been an outlier on introducing standards, lagging well behind countries including China, the US and New Zealand. These shiny new electric cars are getting ready to hit the streets and the government wants more Australians to get behind the wheel. 85% of cars sold around the world are sold under fuel efficiency standards and it's way beyond time that Australia catches up. New rules would require car companies to supply more fuel efficient vehicles with targets set on the average emissions per kilometre for new cars sold, with fines for non-compliance. The government says it would lead to savings of up to $1,000 every year in fuel costs. Australians are paying more at the Bowser than they should compared to people in other country, countries because they're using more petrol and diesel. Car companies have been very clear to us that the latest and best vehicles that they create are often not bought to Australia at all or are bought here years later, specifically because we haven't had these standards in place. The US has had emissions standards since the 1970s, but change in Australia has been a long time coming. We are going to stand by our tradies and we are going to save their utes. The opposition says fuel efficiency standards could make some vehicles unaffordable. We are going to hear all sorts of nonsense uh, from the opposition, from a range of other stakeholders about this. We're going to hear that, you know, utes are, utes are banned. That is not true. The peak body for car manufacturers says current technology is limited. And my greatest concern without doing the analysis is around utes, especially 4x4 utes and large SUVs. The Climate Council says Australia has a long way to go to catch up with the rest of the world. It would be great to have had it done uh, you know, 20 years ago, but here we are and it's good to have it done now. But even with legislation going through Parliament this year, the changes would not come into effect until 2025. Sasha Payne, ABC News. In a second day of major attacks in the Middle East, the US and Britain have launched dozens of strikes on Iran-linked targets in Yemen. The Pentagon hit Houthi rebel groups, saying they destroyed weapons, facilities and missile systems that have been used to attack ships in the Red Sea. The strikes had the support of Australia, alongside other countries like Canada and New Zealand. British and US forces strike 36 Houthi targets in Yemen. It's the second day of US-led operations retaliating against a deadly attack by Iran-backed militias on American troops last week. British warplanes leaving from Cyprus, US aircraft carriers deployed to the region, flying high-stakes missions and firing cruise missiles. Stations. And bomber units from Texas, whose commander says they can engage in any operation anywhere on the globe. The strikes have the support of several countries, including Australia, which officials said included intelligence and assistance with logistics. We want to see the air area settle down. We're working with our allies uh, to play a role there. These are the Houthi fighters they're trying to stop. The Allied strikes hit deeply buried weapons storage facilities, as well as missile and air defence systems the Iran-backed militia are using against international ships in the Red Sea. Before the strikes, the militants released this video of training. Attacking cars and practising kidnapping of people pretending to be foreign soldiers. Iran's proxies have uh, played with fire for months and years and it's now burning them. The US insists the latest attacks are part of an existing operation to degrade the capabilities of the Houthis. But as hostilities intensify, it's clear what's actually happening here in the Middle East. This is an escalating war between the US and the tentacles of Iran. John Lyons, ABC News, Jerusalem. 
Meanwhile, the attacks on Houthi rebels is raising fears of further conflict within Yemen. Nearly a decade of civil war has already devastated much of the nation, plunging it into what the United Nations calls the world's worst humanitarian crisis. Yemenis now fear another war looms. For most of his life, Fuad al-Jadi has walked to class each morning, knowing he may not return home. My school was chilled and I had to stop going for a while. As a child, I was afraid our house would be hit. I was constantly in fear. After nearly a decade of civil war in Yemen, fighting between Houthi rebels and government forces was put on hold in 2022 in a UN-brokered truce. That truce has held longer than expected, allowing 13-year-old Fuad to focus on what matters. We have big dreams. We want to become doctors and engineers. Now his country faces another war against a powerful enemy, threatening to undo the fragile peace. American airstrikes on Houthi rebel targets in Yemen have drawn Washington and some Western allies, including Australia, into an expanding conflict in the Middle East. Residents now worry a dark new chapter is beginning. Locals are stockpiling fuel in anticipation of a war with the West, while business owners are bracing for further economic decline. The news is bad and a war is looming. We worry we'll be forced to shut the factory. In Shima Ibrahim's chocolate shop, Years of conflict forced her to let go of staff, while black market supplies have become unaffordable. We faced the last war bravely, then we're ready for a tough new war. For the generation that's known nothing but, surviving is the only option. Even if there was another war on Yemen, we will not surrender. I will carry on. Tom Joyner, ABC News. As more Australians grapple with the rising cost of living, Canberra businesses say they are dealing with an increase in shoplifting. While the big supermarkets have boosted security, some smaller shop owners aren't sure what more they can do. Shoplifting isn't a new problem for retailers, but Canberra small business owners are concerned it's getting worse. Look, it, it's, it's hard trying to trust anyone or any, anyone that sort of walks through the shop sometimes. While some is largely opportunistic, in other cases, the reason is heartbreaking. It's involving pain medicines, uh, pain and fever medicines for children and infants. So we're finding a lot more empty boxes of kids' Panadol and Nurofen on the shelf. With the cost of living driving people to make the choice to steal, business owners say they would rather help those struggling than be stolen from. I want them to come and talk to their community pharmacist about the situation they're in, rather than have to resort to stealing stock off the shelf so that their kids are OK. Police data shows reports of shoplifting are on the rise, but businesses say cases are likely higher. Most of the time, they don't bother reporting it and simply try to stop it themselves by keeping a close eye on customers or absorb the cost. you just got to wear it. It's just cost of doing business sometimes with these things. So we actually hardly ever in my 10 years as an owner have only once or twice called the police. Uh, we just have to watch it walk out the door. Officially, businesses are advised to get authorities involved as much as possible. The best advice we can offer anyone really is to go through your shop, make sure that you've got your shop laid out in the right way, uh, make sure that you've got cameras in place, make sure that your teams are trained in how to deal with it, and most importantly, to report everything to the police. While the major retailers have bumped up security in response to the rise in shoplifting, adding smart gate technology and employing plainclothes officers to work with police, the smaller retailers without the same budgets aren't sure what more they can do. Lottie Twyford, ABC News, Canberra. A Canberra lawyer who suffered sexual abuse at the hands of her brother has thrown her support behind a campaign for nationally consistent laws. Laura Rowe wants it to be easier for abuse survivors to be able to decide how to publicly share their stories. And a warning, some viewers may find this story distressing. Being sexually abused by her brother during childhood impacted Laura Rowe's entire life. But even after he was found guilty in a criminal trial, she still had to fight to tell her story. In order for sexual assault survivors to be able to identify themselves in the Northern Territory and Tasmania, they have to wait until all legal proceedings are finalised. 
something that sounds pretty simple, but in fact is not. Um, these proceedings can go on forever due to, um, you know, appeals that can drag on for years. Like Grace Tame before her, she enlisted the help of the Let Her Speak campaign, which provided pro bono legal support to help her get an exemption. At first, after I got the court order, I um, hadn't made the decision to go public, but I did use it um, in order to be able to publish the identifying fact that I was a family member of the accused, um, something that was really important to me because I think that family sexual abuse is not um, discussed often enough and is a knock-on effect of these gag laws. She's joined the fight for the anti-use gag laws to be aligned with other states where survivors can self-identify before proceedings are over and tailor their consent. And in Victoria, survivors are able to say their own name provided they're over 18, they give consent in writing, they haven't been coerced and they're not identifying any second or third victim in the process. And that seems like a really sensible model to adopt. When survivors know that they can share their stories and the details of their stories with which they are comfortable, they're more likely to share their stories for the benefit of a whole community. A push to stop stigmas and give survivors control over their own story. Sarah Spina-Matthews, ABC News. Homicide police in Queensland say they want to speak with four men after the stabbing death of a 70-year-old grandmother in a shopping centre car park last night. The woman had just finished shopping at Red Bank, west of Brisbane, when she was stabbed in the chest in front of her six-year-old granddaughter. The woman's car was then stolen. Police found it this morning in nearby Springfield Lakes. Detectives have released security camera vision of four men seen leaving the car and have appealed for witnesses. Families devastated by the deadliest type of childhood cancer say a major research funding boost offers some fresh hope. The federal government has announced $20 million to help find new treatments. Ten-week-old baby Lottie is a treasured third daughter. But she'll never get to meet her eldest sister Ruby, who died almost a year ago. Her just never going to no rooms is just really sad. The six-year-old is remembered by her family and school for her kindness. Ruby lived for just five months after she was diagnosed with DIPG, a type of brain cancer that's always fatal, usually claiming a patient's life within a year. It's scarred our family forever and our little four-year-old Tilly has nightmares and asks if she's going to go to heaven as well. But for the family, today is a great day. The federal government has announced up to $20 million over seven years to fund clinical trials and research to find new treatments. This is an enormous investment in Australia's world-class researchers to give new hope to families who receive the devastating news that their child has developed brain cancer. This announcement is a testament to families affected by this cruel cancer who've pushed for more funding. The government has also secured access to an experimental medication used by some patients with DIPG. Eve Daha was diagnosed with the cancer when she was five and a half. She recently celebrated her eighth birthday, thanks in part to the medication which has cost her family more than $100,000 over three years. Eve is still fighting almost 35 months later thanks to the work of Australian research. So this is just incredible. Happy that, like, now I feel more safe. Emma Pollard, ABC News, Brisbane. An Aboriginal family claims a major insurer slugged their pensioner father with excessive premiums. The last annual bill 88-year-old Leonard O'Meara paid before he died was $10,000, despite his asbestos cottage in Outback Australia being worth very little. Michael Atkin prepared this report, which uses Mr O'Meara's name and image with permission from his family. Leonard O'Meara's home in Derby in WA's Kimberley region is modest but full of heart and history. Mum and Dad were so proud. They were probably the first Aboriginal people in town to buy their own house. Look at this photo here of Mum and Dad in the wedding. 
Oh, that's beautiful, eh? In 2009, the pensioner was sold a home insurance policy when he visited the local branch of ANZ Bank. The policy was underwritten by QBE and initially an ANZ subsidiary. Insurance was just a natural part of home ownership and he paid his premiums every year. Dad's bedroom. His daughters discovered just how much when the 88-year-old asked for help. His premium had jumped to $9,500, more than double the average for northwestern Australia. All has to be redone. I actually thought it was a mistake. And when I saw that, I, I was absolutely gobsmacked. I couldn't believe it. Over more than a decade, the Jaru man diligently paid $54,000. Since 2016, the policy's cost almost quadrupled. So this veranda here, that's all popped up. How are you, Maureen? Financial counsellor Alan Gray is helping the family seek a refund and compensation. Thank you. Mr Gray has obtained an alternative quote with another insurer for $2,850 a year. He questions if his client was charged excessive premiums, known as a loyalty tax, as a long-term customer who wasn't shopping around. This would be the worst insurance rip-off I've ever encountered. I'm absolutely certain that Leonard paid a loyalty tax to QBE. Mr Gray recorded this short video with Leonard O'Meara last September, shortly before his death. He claims the bank pressured him to take out the insurance. They stated that I had to pay that insurance. Well, I didn't want to argue with it because the house was very important to me, so I paid it. His family is demanding answers about why the insurance policy was so expensive when the house is worth so little. A recent valuation estimated it was worth no more than $175,000, mainly for the land. How do they charge an aged pensioner this amount of premiums for a home that we don't even know the value of? QBE denies it ripped off Mr O'Meara, saying his premiums reflected the risks and benefits of the policy, which was for full replacement and that rebuilding would be more expensive to meet current standards. ANZ would not comment on Leonard's case, but insists it gives clear advice to customers about insurance products, taking into account their financial situations. Leonard's experience points to a concerning national trend. Rising premiums are pushing more households to go uninsured or into financial stress as they struggle to afford cover. One in eight households in Australia face insurance premiums that is more than a month of their income. Um, that's about 1.24 million households. Actuary Sharanjit Padam says you can save as much as 50% by shopping around. There is likely to be a better deal out there for you. How much will that... Alan Gray and the family are calling on corporate regulator ASIC to investigate. While the recent loss of Leonard O'Meara remains raw, his family is determined to pursue his alleged mistreatment. I think they took advantage of my dad because of his age, um, his vulnerability, his loyalty. We feel so grieved and so hurt by what they've done to dad that we're definitely going to continue this fight with them. Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan and his wife Bushra have been sentenced to seven years in prison after a court ruled their 2018 marriage broke the law. It's the third ruling against the former cricket star this week and just days before national elections that he's banned from contesting. He's the cricket great turned popular Prime Minister who's already in jail and now Imran Khan's marriage has landed him and his wife a further seven years behind bars. A Pakistan court ruled Bushra Khan did not complete the waiting period mandated by Islam after divorcing her previous husband before marrying Imran Khan five years ago. We were not allowed to produce our own evidence in, in, in our defence and that is absolutely a violation of the fundamental rights that were guaranteed by the Constitution. This latest ruling is on top of a 14-year sentence for the couple, handed down a few days ago for illegally selling state gifts and an extra 10 years for Imran Khan for leaking state secrets. 
Supporters say the charges are trumped up to stop Imran Khan from ever running for office again. These all are political motivated cases just to just to sabotage the elections of 8 February. Thursday's national elections are being hotly contested, with the son of former Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto vying for the top job. As well as another former leader, Nawaz Sharif, who has served jail time for corruption. Imran Khan's party, the PTI, is now forced to field its candidates as independents. For the first time in the history of Pakistan, the entire leadership of a political party is currently either in jail or hiding. The Khans have both denied any wrongdoing. The next step, a High Court appeal. Meghna Bali, ABC News. To sport and an excellent half century from number eight batter Sean Abbott has saved Australia from a low total in the second one day international against the West Indies. The host struggled on a slow wicket falling to six for 142 in the 29th over before Abbott came to the crease. He and debutant Will Sutherland put on 57 for the eighth wicket with Abbott eventually falling for 69 off 63 deliveries as Australia made 258. Gurukesh Moti was the pick of the bowlers, claiming three for 28. Meanwhile, the Australian women's team will be looking to continue its winning form in one-day cricket when it meets South Africa on Wednesday. Megan Shute took one for one off five overs in her 200th international as Australia thrashed the tourists in the first ODI game in Adelaide. An unbeaten 52 from Beth Mooney then ensured that the home team easily reached the victory target of just 106. In the A-League women's, last place Canberra United have upset ladder leaders Melbourne City in their first win against them in three years. Michelle Heyman found open space to give the home side an early lead. Canberra then scored again just two minutes later to extend the lead going into half time. Nikki Flannery finished off a strong team effort to give Canberra a big three goal lead. City's one and only goal came in stoppage time, but the final scoreboard read 3 1. Good on them. Well, to the weather now. And tonight's viewer photo comes from Ken Gibson. And it is of sunrise on the lake ahead of another hot day. Thank you for that, Ken. It was warm today, but the heat wave will soon be over because some rain, well, quite a lot of rain, is coming. Now, after a cool start of just 14 in Tuggeranong this morning, we reached 33 degrees, which wasn't quite as hot as predicted. Inland, though, it was 39 in Wagga and 40 in Griffith. Even Threadbow Top Station hit 21. Bega got to 32 and Maruya 27. In the capitals, Brisbane reached 31, Sydney reached 31 as well. And have a look at Melbourne, 38 degrees today. On the satellite in the south, you can see an approaching cold front and uh, in the middle of the continent, the remnants of ex-tropical cyclone Kiralee have been moving down over western Queensland and into New South Wales. It's going to keep moving south, drenching parts of New South Wales and bringing a lot of moist air to our region, which is going to interact with the cool change and lead to some really decent rain. 32 degrees is on the way for Brisbane tomorrow. A storm and a shower is possible in Sydney and it should be cloudy in Melbourne. At this stage, tonight is expected to be clear around our region, though increasingly cloudy, with the rain arriving tomorrow morning, and you can see it could get quite heavy in the afternoon and evening. There's a chance of a storm across the entire region as well from the early hours of tomorrow morning. The forecast for every major centre is for rain or storms. 29 is expected in Batemans Bay, 28 at Marimbula, 15 at Threadbow Top Station, and 29 degrees in Yass. Here in Canberra and Queanbeyan, there's a 100% chance of rain and we could get up to 45 millimetres tomorrow and another 45 on Tuesday. Our top will be around 26. There's also the possibility of some minor flooding in the Queanbeyan and Molonglo rivers. Sunrise is 21 past 6 and sunset is 13 past 8. And looking ahead, 26 is expected on Tuesday. The rain is likely to linger into the afternoon and 24 is on the way for Wednesday. And at this early stage, next weekend looks like it will be a bit cooler than this one. 
And that is the latest from the Canberra Newsroom for this Sunday evening. I'm James Glenday. It is always lovely to be with you and I hope you have a great week. We'll, of course, be back at the same time tomorrow night. And until then, Yara, good night.